We've got a couple of international speakers that Swine Day has been very good about bringing in to, uh, to address things. First uh, topic, how precision livestock farming can advance pork production. And uh, from Belgium, Dr. Drace Berkmans is the CEO of Sound Talks. Dr. Berkmans obtained a degree in mechanical engineering at the Catholic University of Levine, uh, Belgium in 2005 and April 2010. He finished his PhD in the Noise and Vibration Research Group uh, at Levine on the topics of traffic noise synthesis. In 2011, he was a founder of Sound Talks, a spin-off company of the, the university and of the University of Milan, and which focuses on the development of algorithms for automated sound analysis, something you don't think sounds familiar with uh, livestock production, right? But how do we incorporate that? Sound Talks commercially launched a respiratory disease monitoring uh, for finishing pigs in 2014 and is now developing a new precision livestock farming uh, line of products for the poultry and the swine industry. So welcome Dr. Reese to address the uh, livestock farming and precision agriculture. Okay, thanks a lot. So thank you for the invitation to uh, present here. I'm happy to see that uh, there is quite some people here because I was afraid that ASF session would steal uh, uh, all the audience, to be honest. But um, so today uh, we talk about precision livestock farming. I think it's a huge topic with uh, uh, very different um, uh, aspects to it. Um, it's impossible to cover it all, but um, let's, let's, I, I just made a presentation what I think is uh, of interest to you and what is uh, relevant, and I hope that we leave some time for questions. Maybe just one uh, remark, because I had uh, a few questions already today. Um, if you think the name Bergmans, you've heard about it already, and Belgium, uh, you've heard it before but that I look uh, quite a bit younger than last time you saw me. It's because, um, it's probably because you know my father, who is a professor bioengineer at the University of Leuven and uh, worked his whole life on precision livestock farming. So what do we want to cover today? So um, first, I'll keep it brief because there was already a lot said this morning and I think you all know it's the livestock production challenges in general. Then what is precision livestock farming and how can it uh, potentially help you? Some examples, why should you care? There are four different steps in the development of uh, PLF tools and I think that's an explanation of, uh, because most of the technologies did not uh, go through the four phases yet, that uh, it's difficult for a lot of people to understand the value it brings. Um, that addresses the, the sixth question, why is the adoption slow or why is the perception of adoption slow? And then some take home messages. So first, I'll keep it brief, number of pigs, huge. This is a uh, number from 2017 from FAO, United Nations. Um, can be a little bit lower now with ASF in China, but anyway, it's, we have a lot of pigs globally. Livestock market in general is growing rapidly. Like, we're lucky to be in industries where we can say this. Most industries would be really happy about those numbers. But of course, that also comes with challenges, especially if globally, on a global scale, the number of farmers that we used to, to produce a lot more uh, livestock products is decreasing rapidly. Still today we're in a phase where production loss because of disease, only disease, is still estimated to be about 20%. So talked about this morning, inefficiencies in the complete chain are still uh, very significant. This is a number, I, I don't want to discuss about the number because you can't measure it anyway, but this is an official report from FAO. 10 million deaths, human deaths, per year, caused by antimicrobial resistance. And then we can argue, is it because of uh, overuse of antibiotics in livestock or not? I don't want to start that debate, but it doesn't matter how you do it, it's a huge number. And in combination with this number, the use of antimicrobials is expected to rise with another 67% over that period. And that, that might come as a, as a surprise, because where I come from, in Europe, the use of antimicrobials is going down a lot. I think in the US, roughly the same. But still, the, the problem is we are not the world. Yeah? The two of us are still, uh, and it's mainly because of uh, the growth in other markets, like South, South uh, America and uh, Asia, that still the prediction is that global use will rise a lot. Just I um, introduced with these pictures, um, because the, the simple question, which is the most sustainable system, um, there is, what is sustainable? If you would ask this question to a, an audience, the, the average consumer in, in Europe, for example, they will all think that the picture on the left is the way forward. 
literally. Maybe if you ask it in the uh, center of New York, it will be the same. Um, but I hope that people understand here, of course, it's not it's impossible, it's not sustainable. We can never, with the, the figures we talked about before, uh, come to these type of production systems. On the other hand, the picture on the right, which can help a lot, in my opinion, is the best system to guarantee a lot of welfare as well, which is a very debatable, uh, is debated by a lot of people. Um, but still, it's the best, if we bring in technologies in combination with intense livestock farming, I think it's the best way to guarantee that you have uh, high production standards, high welfare, etc. So, just another uh, one was mentioned about it uh, this morning, uh, was mentioned as well. Um, there are huge concerns. Uh, the, the session about the, uh, let's say, the apps and the, the, the Generation Z. Um, people that have actually no clue about production of livestock will still have a very, very strong uh, opinion about it. And a lot of things have changed. They voice it uh, a lot. Uh, similar to what you had here in Iowa uh, recently uh, with the movies on the farm. We have similar things in the Netherlands, uh, exactly the same. Um, but there, luckily, it, uh, it uh, bites back a lot at them because basically they entered the farm there um, to protest. And basically that day, a lot of pigs were, <laughs> were killed on the farm. So uh, it didn't have the exact results they were hoping for. Um, then you have the other things. Uh, I just this is just like an introduction. I cannot uh, treat them all. You have things like African swine fever. You have uh, a lot of turnover in employees. Uh, that's very poses also a lot of challenges. So in general, there are huge challenges to the complete industry, and um, that's why uh, I want to talk about PLF because I think PLF is a tool that can really help you long term uh, to address some of these challenges. But first, let's uh, do a, a small definition of what it is. So first of all, it's a tool. Yeah? So it's not a magic formula. It's not something that uh, if you use it, that suddenly will solve all your, all your problems. It's not the, the silver bullet thing. It's a tool. It can help you if you use it well to do the things you do now to do it better. So what is it doing? It's continuous, automated, and real-time monitoring. So continuous, 24-7, all the time. Automated, it should work independent, should not add work to, uh, to what you're already doing. It should take work away from what you're doing. And it's in real time, meaning we can react still fast uh, based on what's coming out of this. What do we monitor? It's a range of things. I would say all aspects related to uh, livestock production. Welfare, health, in general, production or reproduction or environmental things. Just some examples that, we, that you know what we're talking about. Um, these are real life examples, they work. Yeah? I will first on this slide show some examples of uh, non-pork uh, and later we go to pork examples. So the one on the left is a cow. Every, it's a camera looking at the cow and in real time, every day when the cow is walking to the, the milk robot, they will analyze if the cow has lameness or is developing lameness. And that's a very useful tool because it's a very huge problem in, uh, in uh, dairy cattle. And that's a, that's a system that exists. You can see the model uh, uh, being fitted on the, on the legs of the, the cow. This is another example where um, it's about monitoring emissions. Uh, there was an assumption that if you, uh, based on the light control, just light schedule in the house, you can actually, uh, by changing that, decrease a lot of the emissions of the total house. And yeah, the relation is the light has an influence on the activity of the birds. When they are a lot of active, there is a lot of dust uh, in the air, and uh, that relates to the emission. So that was a project uh, about that. This is another one for broilers where a camera is looking down. You can see all the chickens are green. It's because a computer program has automatically identified where the chickens are and, and then they color it green. Um, and uh, what you can do with that is you can first of all see um, how do they move in the house. Um, and second, you can see where are they. And that is a, a, a typical and early warning in case you have, for example, a draft and chickens move away from that, that can help you. Uh, to identify early that there is a problem um, in the farm. This is another one for uh, bird control. Uh, actually, the, the producer gets a warning uh, when bird is actually starting, and so uh, they get a phone call then, and then instead of having to go check uh, in the night all the time, they just wait for the phone call, and then they uh, can help uh, the animal. Things with horses, heart rate monitoring to, uh, to increase performance of uh, race horses. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention here is that um, precision livestock farming in general has a very solid scientific background. Um, you see it now in US as well, it picks up, you see it in, in a lot of universities here. Um, but there is a, quite a, a long history to that and most of the things we say here, they have a solid uh, scientific background. 
So some examples when we uh, first talk about pigs. So I'll, I'll talk about five examples in a pig house. So water monitoring, weight estimation monitoring by camera, activity monitoring, what are the animals doing? How do they move? Are they laying down? Are they standing? What do they do? Um, aggression detection, um, also by camera. And last one, which is what my company is doing. So uh, I, I try to not make a commercial presentation. I will talk mostly about all the other stuff. But what my company is doing is uh, respiratory problems to detect that and give uh, feedback about uh, respiratory problems in the house based on sound. So if we start with uh, water monitoring, so the principle is very simple. You use a water meter, you monitor how much water is flowing through the pipes um, every day or every minute. You typically have a graph like the one on the left. It's going up and down, which is not um, strange. Yeah, it's uh, related to the feed times. When there is feed, there, they will also drink. Um, and then in itself, there is the daily pattern. Um, that in itself, and that's a, a, an introduction to what I will tell later, that in itself is the problem with a lot of PLF tools at the moment. There is a lot of value in it, but when we give a graph like this to the average producer, of course you don't have time to, to really figure out what is going on and so on. You have so many pigs that of course it's impossible to do something useful with it. But this is the basics. Yeah? The basics, there is a lot of information in the graph and it's up to the, the rest of the industry to make it more useful for you. On the right, you can see the top right is uh, um, we did an experiment in, uh, in, um, in an experimental farm in the Netherlands where we asked the, the caretaker to, with an uh, iPad type of thing, to indicate when they see there are certain problems. And from those tests, it's actually amazing because they know we are monitoring them. They know we, we want to be faster than them. And then the question is, how much faster can you, can you be? Um, I don't have the, the time here to go into all the details, but there are a lot of publications about the, the experiments already. So um, here, just based on the water monitoring, you can detect swine flu two days earlier, and just the comparison with the reference room is about $4.2 uh, per pig, which is huge uh, if you would achieve that in real time. And these are people that are convinced that they immediately see it. Huh? So it's normal that the caretaker is there. Uh, the reality is disease is so complex that it, it's always later than if you monitor 24 hours a day. Then you have more practical problems with the same drinking uh, monitoring that, that you can detect. One day earlier that uh, one of the drinking nipples was failing, you can also see the pigs uh, standing all there. They, they actually want to drink, but they can't um, at the moment. And another one where four days where uh, there was a feeder that was failing. So there was some feed, but not enough feed. Uh, coming through um, and that's uh, also uh, like four days uh, before because the feeding is related to the, the water uptake. This is another example uh, of real-time uh, weight uh, monitoring for pigs. So these are actually two totally different systems uh, developed independently from each other but basically they, they have the same purpose to try in real time measure the, the weight of the pigs so that you can see if the, the growth trajectory is normal or when it's, it stalls uh, that you can, uh, can try to react. So on the left you can see the, the pigs in blue with the blue are the pigs that are currently in a position where it's, uh, they are good enough to, to do a weight uh, estimate while the other ones, the red ones, they are not in a position where you can do it at the moment. But that's, it's in real time so you have 24 hours to do all the measurements so uh, they will come in a position uh, later where you can do it. And the right approach you can see uh, with the, the, the screens that it's already a, a relatively old. Um, old one is where they have a top view camera in front of the feeder, so close to the feeder, and they try to measure the, the, the weight of the pigs when the pig is coming to the feeder. And the relationship with the weight and the camera is, you can see it on, on the right, the top right, is based on the camera image, you are calculating uh, the dimensions that are um, shown there, and based on that you can make a volume uh, estimation which then relates in a weight estimation. Um, one of the reasons, I'll come back to this example later, why I think it's not used a lot at the moment, or there are several reasons, but uh, one reason, uh, I'll come back to that later. Another one is uh, more or less the same principle. This comes from a European project um, called EUPLF, was an FP7 uh, EU funded project where you place cameras uh, like on top of the pigs. And basically, similar to what we did with the, I explained with the broilers earlier, um, you just see where are the pigs all the time, but you do it in real time, 24 hours a day. Where are they? Are they moving? So the top one is, uh, so there, I'll just try to, this one shows you where are the pigs, and the other one is how did the pigs move? Like, 
there is one second in between two images and the, the green spots is how did they move. And you can say, why is this relevant to us? Well, it's relevant because pigs should have a normal behavior. Like they have, they become more active in the afternoon. All pigs do that. It's, it's, and it's when, when you start to have changes, when suddenly the normal pattern is not there anymore, that it's an indicator of something's wrong. And that's why a camera-based system could, uh, could help there. So you have different types of activities, high activity, resting activity, position of the pigs. Um, can be an early warning for disease, for lameness, uh, for being too cold, etc. Then this is one uh, from the University of Leuven where they did um, a detection of aggression based on camera. So the idea is that um, you try to identify also which pig is causing the aggression. That was one idea. And the second idea is um, basically it was shown that you can but the aggression is never a very sudden thing. There is always a, a building up towards the aggression. And they basically showed that uh, you can stop most of the aggression. Um, this, is, this is a type of um, tool that I don't see ending up in a commercial farm very soon. Yeah? Because there are m many more applications that are, let's say, closer to commercial application. But still, it's amazing that you can actually show, um, you can measure in real time, it is going to happen that the aggression will es escalate and that we still have time to actually do something about it. And doing something about it very often is playing a sound that they recognize and giving them a little bit of food feed. And that stops the aggression and then uh, everything's uh, gone. Then this is uh, what my company is doing, so I will not talk too long about it, but we are just about uh, reintroducing it in the US now. We are in a controlled launch phase. So you see the tool on the left. It's a, it's a device with uh, microphones, temperature sensor, relative humidity, light sensor, and so on. And what we do is we place them typically in a 1200 head barn. We would place about uh, four um, along the length. And typically it would produce in the first phase a graph like this. So on the horizontal axis is, uh, is time, is uh, one fattening batch. And on the vertical axis is total number of cuffs um, counted on a day. And you can see there is a lot of dynamics. And um, I will not go into detail about this one. We, had, we have a lot of publications about it as well. But basically there are a lot of things you can learn about this graph. Because first of all you have the peaks, yeah, the outbreaks of something going, going, uh, going on at the time. But also, if we, if we bring more data into, into the picture, you can compare it with different rooms, different sites. What does a vaccine do? What does treatment do? There is a whole uh, uh, application around this. Then I'll come back to um, why I think you should care about PLF. Um, I think, in general, <coughs> it improves the management practices. And it allows you to, um, to take better care for money. So the most... Um, let's say, stupid thing you can do is actually spend equal time to every pig every day. Because they don't need the same amount of care every day. But of course, if you don't have tools to, um, to know where to look every day, yeah, it becomes very difficult. And I think PLF in general can make you use, spend your time where it's needed that day. That's a, it's a huge improvement. But of course, then you need to get that information out. Um, in general, less con contamination, increased production control, predictability in the production chain, that's also a huge one. Um, it can help animal welfare. I think the problem with animal welfare at the moment is that um, it's something you cannot market. Also in Europe, uh, it's something that it's there, but basically it's not economically... If you have a farm where you spend a lot of attention and the welfare is a lot higher, it's not that it can... Uh, it's economically so... Uh, it's still a very marginal part of the market. Uh, but still, I think in general we would like animal welfare to be high and I think PLF can offer the tools to also do that. So PLF helps the producers to manage the animals better and it helps the livestock via the improvement of their health, welfare and in general their uh, well-being. So uh, just as a, as a summary, like if we go back to the beginning, in an environment where the number of animals per caretaker will keep on increasing, where the demand for meat is, or livestock products in general is going up incredibly, where you have uh, consumers that are complaining a lot more than they used to. Um, I think with all these factors, yeah, I think PLF will become inevitable. That's my personal opinion. Um, because it's the only way how you can do that. You need technologies to help you manage more animals with the same amount of time that you have every day. So if we talk about sick pigs, for example, um, it's costing a lot of money to producers and it's 
the, the, one of the difficulties, come back to that later, is that it's very hard to measure how much, yeah? because it's in a lot of, um, let's say, hidden uh, factors. Of course, there is more labor required. The herd is less homogeneous, very expensive, but uh, nobody can really put a, a measure of, uh, of dollars on that. Um, treatment costs, of course, average daily gain, uh, feed conversion, etc. It's a whole lot of aspects, and the problem is it's very difficult to model, because if you do um, a model, like at a university, you do a scientific model about it, the problem is that very small changes to the parameters can make you incredibly rich which makes that nobody believes uh, the model anymore. Um, then individual feeding uh, yeah, can increase the feed margin. I'll come back to that later. <coughs> First, I want to, to um, talk a little bit about when there is a PLF sensor and when you develop a PLF sensor, there is typically um, four phases. So now I'm talking from the technology provider point of view and not the customer. And for, the, for us, as technology providers, there are typically four phases. The first phase is it's a simple sensor. That's always the start. Without that, we cannot start. So what does it mean? It means the graph I showed you before, the number of cuffs versus time. It shows you the water consumption versus time. It shows you activity of animals in function of time, for example. It's basic. It's a graph. The problem with that is that for a customer, it's most of the time useless because you don't have time to do the interpretation of the graph, you don't have time to, you sometimes don't have the skills or the knowledge or you don't, basically it's, it's not at a point where you can really use it. The second step, which is already better but it's not uh, the end game, is when there is an alert based on that. For example, coughing is too high today in barn uh, two, um, the water consumption, there's something wrong because the pigs are not drinking. Something like that. It's already better because you, can, you, you know more or less, okay, this is the problem, I can go and check it out. Um, but still, still very often it's not good enough. Yeah? Step number three would be when there is advice, like um, in, in the, for example, the respiratory health, it's, a, it's very complex depending on the history of the farm, depending on the vaccination strategy, the treatment and so on. The advice can be different, but it would be like coming to the point where we actually tell the, um, the producer, what should you do now? What's the advice to do? Yeah? Which is different than just giving an alert. And then step number four, which is not possible for all the applications, but for some it's really a useful uh, uh, application, is fully automated control. If we know what we advise you to do, in some cases where it's uh, ethically uh, okay to do it, for example, if we know the, temp the temperature is too low, um, increase the temperature, if that would be the advice, then obviously uh, later you can also close the loop and just increase the temperature. So when we go from step one to step four, the, cl the complexity to create it from a technology provider point of view goes up dramatically, but also the usefulness for the user. So I think this is uh, in one slide already a little bit an explanation of why PLF, the adoption is sometimes slow. Um, is because most of the tools are still phase one, phase two, and are not uh, the full thing. What we did, and this is just a slide, it shows you, um, this is a mix of technology providers and producers uh, in different countries. We did in the EU PLF project a lot of um, discussions with the producers, like what's, what should be the next step, how can we make it better for you, and then you see that for all the applications there is uh, a lot of work to do in order to make it a more uh, useful uh, tool in the end. This one, um, maybe just inform how much time do we have left, roughly? We have ten more minutes. Ten more minutes, perfect, perfect. Um, so this is a, another example, like where you can take it to the next step. So if we start, um, sorry, I didn't have a better uh, picture, but if we start here, the one we talked about before, if you can measure pick weight in real time, all the time then that in itself is already an indicator. You can make an alert based on that. Uh, growth is slowing down, for example. It's already, it's, it's better, yeah, it can help you. But one of the things that, uh, that was tested in uh, scientific research now, um, and that I believe can be a real winner because feed cost is still a huge cost uh, across the whole uh, production of a, of a pig, is where you try to model um, how you can maximize the, the, the feed margin. So it means um, give the pig, so, you have two types of feed, let's start with that. You have two types of feed, A and B. You have a more expensive feed, but they grow faster because of that. You have a more cheap feed, but um, it's, uh, they grow slower. 
What we do then is we measure in real time the weight of the pig and the, the ones that are a little bit in front of the rest, you give them more of the cheap feet. The ones that are more behind, you give them more of the, um, of the stronger feet and the more expensive feet. You measure again the growth and then you model based on that individual pig, you just model what's the optimal ratio between feet A and feet B for that pig and you apply that every day. And in this, it's, uh, it, the difficulty is it's, it's not very straightforward now to implement it in existing livestock houses, but in, a, in, like in experimental farms, it's huge. The amount of money you can save with that is huge because basically for every individual pig, you, gave, you can give it the optimized uh, ratio of feed. And so that's uh, where you can see that it goes from uh, step one to four. In step one is a simple sensor. How much are the pigs growing in function of time? Step two, alarm. The growth of one individual pig is slowing down or a pen of pigs is, is slowing down. Um, number three is advice, um, increase the percentage of feed A, for example, while step four would be fully automated. You have an automated feeder and it will just do it for you. This, of course, it doesn't work in a typical setup that you have now in a US-based uh, farm, but we have the same problems in Europe, but it will gradually enter because uh, I'm, I'm convinced it will come because just the costs you can save with it are huge. And we have these experimental systems where the pigs walk through gates and then every day they go left, right, and that's a, uh, a system. But it requires a, a, a totally different livestock house, which is why it's uh, difficult to implement. Why is the adoption slow? There are just a lot of, um, a lot of points and uh, the, the biggest one, uh, I left it out because that it can spark a whole discussion. And uh, The biggest one is who owns the data? It always comes back. Yeah? And I think the answer is very clear. The producer owns the data, but there is, we can talk for a few hours about that point only. Let's talk also about the other stuff. Lack of, lack of clear return on investment. Yeah? I think it's a, that's a complex, it's a complex, Growing pigs is a complex business. There are a lot of aspects into it. If you compare group A with group B, there is, they are never the same. It's not that you just changed one little thing. There is always something else going on, which means that basically you can only do clear return on investment calculations if you can cover a wide group. You have a lot of installations, then it becomes easy because you average out all the other parameters and then you can do it very well. But that's a chicken and egg problem. In order to introduce a lot of PLF tools, you have to prove the value. And in order to prove the value, you actually need a lot of PLF tools. That's, uh, that's where it's uh, a little bit turning around. Cost and reliability of hardware, for sure. Yeah, I think uh, that's, it's very clear. A lot of the tools are still too expensive at the moment. Um, and that, that's also a volume related thing. When volume goes up, price goes down. Typical market uh, um, aspects, but um, that's where we are at the moment. <coughs> what we call trees versus wood, I don't know if you, if you say that in, uh, in English, but in Dutch we say that. It's, uh, there is so much coming to you as a producer now that you have no clue what to choose from and which one is better than the other. It's very, very difficult to make a choice. And to make it worse, a lot of the solutions are also individual. They are not uh, really, you cannot couple them to a lot of other tools and that makes it uh, a nightmare. Yeah? And that, I think, is a, is a challenge for the technology providers, but I also believe that solutions for that will come, and they will come actually quite fast. Too much data, not enough information. That's a, also a clear one. It talks back to the four phases. Um, lack of clear business models. I think that's also a, a, a clear point. Um, producers in general, globally, are used to buy product and are not so used to buy service in, in the majority of things. Um, and I think PLF is clearly a service, it's not a product. It's not something you sell and then say goodbye. It doesn't work like that. Um, it's a transaction that keeps going and that, uh, that, that you need to establish. And that drills down to a lot of different problems. There are no, no good distribution channels, sales channels. It. There are a lot of aspects related to that. And like I said, not many uh, PLF applications are sufficiently mature. Okay. Then I just want to, just my, my view on uh, PLF that it will come, just to remind the non-believers. This is a picture of uh, the first telephone and it says, the telephone has so many shortcomings, it's it cannot be seri seriously considered as a means of communication. Uh, that's the, the Western uh, di digital uh, company. Well, you can imagine it's true because there were only two phones. Yeah, if you wanted to make a call, you, the, the other person needed to be waiting on the other side of the line, and basically there was not a lot you can do with it. And if it's a product in that 
state, yeah, it's indeed a quite useless uh, tool, but it doesn't mean, I think now everybody would more or less agree that's a pretty good invention, no? So that's where I, uh, and I have two more examples. The other one is uh, aspirin, where actually uh, they say that it's typical Berlin hot air, it's not a good product, etc. Um, and now more than 10 billion tablets of aspirin are swallowed every year. It's not too bad. Um, and the last one, it's uh, the Apple guys going to uh, both HP and uh, Atari and uh, doing their offering. And uh, they basically say, uh, you, you, don't have, you don't even have a degree, how can you make a company? Maybe also not the best uh, choice in hindsight. Last slide is uh, just some take home messages. Um, so the point with the previous slide was, we know there are still problems with the PLF tools to make it very useful, but I also know, I also, I really think it will not take us 100 years. It took 100 years for the phone, it will not take us 100 years, believe me. But uh, there is some work left to do. And some take home messages, so PLF has become applicable in real field conditions. There are examples of really uh, useful tools that exist today and are uh, present in the market. It's still a tool, yeah? If you, uh, if you get a warning, for example, that something is wrong and nobody takes action, then basically the pigs, uh, not, 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 not really a lot is changing then. Um, it creates information based on objective uh, uh, information, continuous, real time, and there is a lot of science behind it. Um, it will continue to challenge the business models of all stakeholders. That's, uh, it's causing a shock, I think, in the whole industry, and that's, nobody really knows how to deal with it, and that's uh, also a, a reason why uh, adoption might be a bit slow. It will create a service industry. It's not a product, it's a service. Um, but I also think it has the potential to really change the sector and to uh, create a more sustainable uh, livestock sector. Thank you. Very good. I have time for a few quick questions while I get the next presentation up. Any questions? Yes. In the full implementation of PLF, when you have your four steps, what happens if there is a faulty sensor? Have you considered redundancy? That's why I wanted to, it's a very good question. I think, first of all, there needs to be redundancy, but also I think that, the, I maybe didn't stress it enough, but two things. First, it will never um, replace the human factor. Yeah? It's a tool to help the human that is under a lot of stress because there are so many animals and what, whatever you have to do all day. So it's, that's one aspect. It's not a replacement, so there is always the human factor. And the second is, I also believe that a lot of things you cannot go to phase four. For example, if I take my product, um, respiratory health monitoring, I don't think it's a very good idea to say, oh, the alarm goes off, let's give them antibiotics automatically. Technically, it's not so difficult, yeah? but it's pretty unethical to do. So that's not the objective. That's, not, that's a typical example where you cannot go to phase four. Because even if you only make a, uh, an error in 0.01% of the cases, still it's very unethical to do so. Yeah? And that's a typical example where you, you cannot do it. But for a lot of other things, it's not so complex and you can do it. One more in the back there. Is there any, uh, any indication of one of the biggest limitations I see is the cost of individual pig ID? Is there any technology coming down the line that would make individual pig ID less expensive than it is right now? You mean in the fattening stage or in the... Um, <laughs> I, I, I know that uh, a company Antelic, for example, was uh, sold for four billion euro, uh, dollars to, uh, what was it, Merck, I think. Uh, so, yeah, I think there will be ways for individual pig identification that are a lot cheaper than they are today. Um, the question is also, what do you relate it to? Um, do you, what I mean with that is, um, to what extent should you know the individual pig, or is it the pen, or is it... There are a lot of applications and it will go from the, um, it will not go from, from where we are now to immediately the, the best ever product. It will go in a little bit steps. Like uh, now, now everything is group based, is for the more or less the full 1200 pigs in a, in a house roughly. Um, it's not really very individual on a pen based level, uh, most of the things. Um, and I think it will go down in steps uh, a little bit. The problem of course is that they eat Pigs like to eat the tag. That's one of the biggest problems. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Berkmans. I think uh, hopefully you're all intrigued by give you some food for thought and so forth. So yes, 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 yes. yes.